God's unstoppable love. Number five, God loves the wanderer. A couple of questions for you to start it off. What do you think God, uh, what does God think about people who wander away from him? Anybody? What do you think God's thinking? Yeah, you can just say it out. Okay. He loves them, so oh, we'll, we'll come to that question. How does God feel? But Okay, he loves them. Any, any, have you ever kind of imagined what God's like thinking? That's a tough one, right? We can imagine maybe what he's feeling. Hmm. Okay. Why would, why would you wander away from God, right? Why would you wander away from me? Okay. Anyone else? Frustrated. Frustrated. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> it's really hard to, th- to think about what God thinks, right? <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's, an, that's an interesting, uh, I mean, you can, you can uh, that's not one of the questions in small group, but you can, ta- if, you're, if you're bored with the questions that are there, you can toss that one around a little bit. How does, like, how do you figure out what God thinks? <clears throat> okay, ha- uh, how about specifically when people, like, just kind of leave God's church behind, going, like, I'm done with church? What is God thinking? <laughs> this is, that's, that's a hard question. It's way harder than it, than it uh, appears. How about just people maybe wandering from the truth? Whatever the truth may be. Capital T, I guess that's Jesus, right? Sorry, somebody said something. Mm, okay. So um, this is the question you guys have been answering. Because <laughs> that was a re- the, the first one's really, really tough. How does God feel about those who wander away? You've already s- expressed some feelings. Is there any else? Anything else? Sad, like brokenhearted, eh? Anything else? All right. Now, our big question, does God continue to love people who rebel against him? Can rebellion stop God's love? Mm, Getting tougher, hey? (laughs) Nobody's saying anything this time. Can rebellion, is rebellion something that is uh, a more unstoppable, I was going to say an unstoppabler, <laughs> more unstoppable force than God's love? Well, let's find out. So our story today is entitled The Squanderer. And you're wondering why we called it God Loves the Wanderer? Well, it's the wanderer it's the squanderer who wandered. <laughs> okay, so you know this story very well. And it's a great story. But there may be some, you might learn some things from this story maybe they didn't know. Well, <clears throat> this story begins with a man who had two sons. Now the youngest son came up to the father, his father, the man, and said, uh, I'm done with you. I want out of here. Show me the money. See you later. Now, this was a long time ago, first century. And so this would have been an awful thing. It's, it's an awful thing to do right now, right? Can you imagine going up to your, your mom or dad right now and just saying, you know what? What I'd really like is everything that you're putting away for me uh, when you die. I'd like that right now. So basically you're saying, I wish you were, I wish you were dead right now. So this is... Uh, we're introduced to a son who is not very nice. That's a nice way to put it. Well, what do you think dad's going to do? Well, very interestingly, the father agrees. Gives his son his share 
of the inheritance, which in the first century, the oldest son would have had, I forget, oh no, I forget, I think it's two-thirds, and then all the rest of the sons would get, would split the rest up, but there's only two, so he'd get a third. So we're kind of given this idea this guy's pretty rich. So even a third of the inheritance is a large sum of money. And so, what does this youngest son do? Well, just like he said, I want to get out of here, he leaves. And he goes to the city, and he lives, he lives it up. He, in fact, he lives it up so much that he ends up squandering all the wealth that his father had given him in wild living. And so there's all sorts of stuff <laughs> that he was into, obviously. Uh, you can use your imagination. What is wild living like? Um, and with a large sum of money that suddenly was no more. Unfortunately for, or maybe fortunately in the story, but unfortunately at this moment for the, son, for the younger son, a famine hits the land. There's no food or very little. And we come into some hard times. And he doesn't know what to do. He's squandered all the money his, his dad gave to him. Like all of it. He's got nothing left. In fact, he gets so desperate that this first century Jewish boy gets hired as uh, a servant to feed the pigs. Now, that might not seem like a big deal to you. In fact, you might have pigs. <laughs> but back in the first century, that was the worst of the worst for a Jewish boy because pigs were unclean, and as a Jew, you wouldn't be around pigs. He wasn't just around them. He was, he was the one who fed them. In fact, he got, it got so bad, and we're kind of given this, the illusion, that, or not the illusion, the, kind of the image that uh, he's not being treated very well by who's ever hired him. And he's starving, and he's feeding the pigs, and he's looking at the food, and he's feeding the pigs like slop, like garbage. And he's like, I wish I could eat that. So just imagine for a second, can you imagine being that hungry, like that starving, that you look at pig food, and you go, mmm, <laughs> food. Like, I, I don't know if I can imagine that. That's tough. Because it's hard to imagine being so hungry you would eat something like that. But again, we're, we're thinking about a Jewish boy too. He's, he wants to actually eat with the pigs. Well, in the story, and the story is found in Luke, in the Gospels, in the Bible, <clears throat> it's a, it has this phrase at this point in the story, that he came to his senses so what's happening here is he suddenly realizes where he is and what's happened. And so he starts remembering and thinking about home. And he thinks, you know what? Like my dad's hired hands, like his servants, they're, they're treated really well. They, they don't, he doesn't make them starve. He makes sure they're well fed. And he takes care of them. And you're kind of given this idea that, that this father, he takes care of all of the servants and everyone's kind of doing well there, at least in this, in this young son's mind. And so as he thinks about home and the conditions of home, he makes a choice. And he's like, I'm, I'm going to go home. Now just let's stop for a second and just imagine that you're this this son, or if you're a girl, let's go with this, a daughter. And you, you have done this to your dad. You have hurt him in the worst way possible. And then you took everything that he gave you and you blew it, squandered it. And all that you have to show for it is the rags that you're wearing and you're starving. Like that's a desperate situation, right? You guys feel it? Like this guy is, he's desperate. 
And so he has to lay down his pride and go back to the person that he, that he hurt more deeply than you can imagine. And he's thinking, like, how am I, what am I going to say? How do I get back? And he, he, he realizes that, you know what, it, I've blown the opportunity to be my dad's son. Like, that's done. So he starts thinking, well, how can I get in? And he goes, he comes up with this little speech. I, I know I've sinned, against, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Please take me back as a hired hand and I'll, I'll just work for you. So he starts the journey. I'd like to think that he went fast, but he's starving, right? He just doesn't have any energy. He's got, he's got to walk all the way home. And so he's trudging. And I bet you he's rehearsed this little speech a million times as he's walking down the side of the road towards home. And we jump into the story in Luke chapter 15 in, in verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. Now there's something there. We're going to come back to that. And was filled with compassion. Now you guys, I want you to, I want you to really focus in on, on, on dad right now. Okay, so son's been gone. He doesn't know if he's alive or dead. You know, they're not hooked up on social media, <laughs> right? Didn't call dad collect. <laughs> you guys don't even know what that is. He didn't call dad on his cell. <laughs> well, like, dad, can I come home? He has to go and meet him face to face. And so this is, um, just so you know, you know, the Bible talks about what to do with rebellious sons. And it's not very good. It, in fact, it's awful. And so Jesus is telling this story in the first century to Jewish people who knew the consequences and the, the penalty for being a rebellious child. And so this is the shock factor. What's the father going to do? What should he do? What would a good father do? Like this guy shamed him. And this is an honor-shame culture, and that's a, that, it's a no-no today in our culture, but it's worse, way worse back then. And so as Jesus is telling this story, we're going to transition away from thinking about the young man and the father for a second and think about the hearers. The hearers are going to be shocked because God, God's not like this. Jesus is, Jesus is exposing something. He's revealing something about God that the people who are listening, even though they've known God their whole lives, don't realize. Because to them, this is not what God would do. So this is the shock factor. So he saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Well, that's an interesting greeting to someone who has hurt you more than you can imagine. Well, it's the, son, the son's turn, right? He knows. He's probably a little surprised at the hug and kiss. And his father running. We'll talk about that later. Well, speech time, right? So the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. <laughs> this is good. So notice something here. The father does not respond to the son. I think this is really important. He doesn't try to make him feel better. He doesn't tell him, oh, it's okay, it's okay. You're, it's all right. This is what he does. But the father said to his servants, 
<laughs> right? So his son is just a passionate plea. Please take me back as a servant, as a hired hand. And the father has just, he's filled with compassion. He's hugged him. He's kissed him. And as the son is probably sobbing and through the tears saying this, he doesn't even respond to the son. He turns to his servants and this is what he says. Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Really? Does he deserve this? No way, right? This guy did a terrible thing. How can this father do this? It's almost shameful for the father to do that, wouldn't it? To take this son back like this? No. This is the story Jesus tells. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Like This is not just a hired hand. This ring is very significant. uh, Signifying that this young man is not just, I'm not just taking him back to live here. He is my son. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. So he was, he, had, he was coming there in bare feet. Like he must have been a wreck. <laughs> Bring the fattened calf. He's not done yet, right? That's not, we need more, we need more. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Well, as the story goes on, what do you think the older son's gonna do? Well, he hears the commotion. It's like, what's going on? It's like, who's throwing a party? No, I didn't get, I didn't get an invite. What's going on? And so he rushes back home. And what does he see? His little brother who squandered his wealth who shamed this, their father, who did terrible, vile things, left and said, you know, good riddance, I don't want to see you guys again, I'm out of here. And now the older son, and just let's put ourselves in his shoes for a second. What are you going to feel? You've been working for your dad. You've been, like, every day being faithful doing all the things that he, that he asked you to do. Jealous, yeah. And so it is. In fact, that's what it says. <laughs> he was jealous. Because he's like, this, and I can just imagine what he's thinking. Like, he doesn't deserve this. Like, how can the father do this? In fact, I'm thinking that the older son just felt Shame. Like, this is shameful. How can you take this guy back? He has wronged us in the worst way. And the father notices and says, hey, um, uh, you know, this is, this is my boy. <laughs> this is my son too. Like, you're my son as well. Like, come and join us. Well, what do you think the older son's going to do? No way. This son of yours, he says, doesn't even call him his brother and doesn't want to come into the party. Now this particular parable was was told, um, it was actually, it was told to a group of people, but it was directed toward the Pharisees, the religious people. And so he told this whole story about this young son. All the time, coming to this final point where the Pharisees were meant to see themselves as the older son because they all would have been feeling exactly what he felt. That younger son did not deserve what you just did. Now the problem that we find in the parable is that the older son somehow thought he deserved, deserved it. And just humanly speaking, like he was faithful. Like he was, he was even, like in the story, he was working at the time the younger son came home. Like he was being faithful to his father. 
doing all the things that he'd asked. And so there's something in us that really identifies with that older son. It's like, that is not fair. When somebody who gets something, I mean, just think about this. I'm sure you all have had this experience where someone gets something that you would like and you know that you deserve it way more than them. Right? Have you guys, I've I've been there. Have you guys been there? And it's, that's not fair. Have you ever said those words? (laughs) Because that's what's happening here. And so, to answer our beginning question, can wandering away from God, can rebellion stop God's love? This story, this is the power of this story. Even the most terrible rebellion, the terrible things that the son said to the father could not stop the father's love for his son. See, um, we often feel like we've wandered away from God's love at times. The older you get, the more you've done this. And there's periods in my life where I would just completely identify with the younger son, where I just, I, I wandered away. There's other times where I totally understand the older son because I'm, I'm at that point in my life am doing the stuff I'm supposed to do or trying to, <laughs> trying to be faithful. And I can identify with both of them. But the story is actually not about the squanderer or, or either of the sons. The story is actually about the father. The father is the main character of this story. <clears throat> and the reason is, is because the father in this story is revealing something about God's love that's scandalous and truly unbelievable. How can God as a father love his son like this? How can God love you like he loves that younger son? So the tale of the squanderer tells us a different story. Like, God's love doesn't decrease the further you get away from him. (laughs) Right? Again, we've got this thing. It's about our... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. What it's revealing is is two fatal flaws. More than that again, but what does this do to? In how we view God's love. The first one is that God's love is for the well-behaved. And we might just disagree with that statement. But deep down inside, there's something that actually agrees with it. It's hinged on behavior. It really is. And it's really hard for us to separate that. <clears throat> I mean, in those, in those times when you're struggling maybe with your behavior or your thoughts or your flaws or your mistakes or whatever you're struggling with, or maybe feelings of unworthiness like the sun. Can you imagine somebody um, that God does love? And think, if I could only be like so-and-so. If I could only be like this person. The good thing is in your small group, you actually get to identify that person. So you got a little bit of time to let it percolate. Who is that person that you're thinking of? If I could only be like this specific person then God would love me too. And it's interesting because we'll say that at the same time while agreeing, oh yeah, God loves me. And yet, it's betraying something when we're thinking these kinds of thoughts. Okay, I, I think that in my mind, but I maybe have more trouble accepting how much God loves me. Or you might be thinking, like especially if you really struggle with being faithful, following the rules, doubts. You might be thinking, if, if only I could get, <laughs> I got pirate uh, language here. If only I could get me act together, my act together, I could be loved. I'm thinking of a, you guys know the song by uh, John Meyer, or Mayer? 
Um, I should have wrote the words down. I can feel that one. Oh, what is it called? Uh, do you guys know who John Mayer is? Okay. <laughs> I thought I could remember the words because I think about it lots. And then suddenly it's just gone. I can feel the love I need, but it's never gonna calm the way I am. It's a powerful song. And I found, like, I really like the tune. It's, and it's good. It's, it's like a, it's a single, it's a, kind of a sing-along song. But the message is heartbreaking. And the reason it's heartbreaking, well, there's a number of reasons, but one of them is because I, when I'm singing it, I'm often agreeing with it. I feel like that a lot. And it's just whatever it is inside of me, and I think it's in all of us, I'm not enough. And so deep down inside, there's a pushback against God truly and deeply loving you for who you are. And if it's in me, I, I think it's in you too. <laughs> if I could get my act together, if I could just change some things about me, then I could be loved. And that's that message of the song. Will it wash out with the water or is it always in the blood? Is, is the line. Like he's wondering if it's just him, if it's, if it's who he is. Or is it a phase, or is it something that can change? God's love is only for the well-behaved. The second flaw is that God's love is smaller than my sin or my rebellion. And I kind of alluded to it earlier when I talked about our rebellion being, is rebellion a more unstoppable force than God's love. And so here's the type of thinking that's revealing that, that, that we just have too small of a view of God's love and too big of a view of ourselves <laughs> and our own rebellion or sin or whatever it is. I doubt too much. I sin too much. I've squandered the thing. Whatever God has given me, I'm a squanderer. I've squandered... Uh, I, Specifically, I had the potential that God has given me too much, right? I've been too unfaithful. I don't deserve to be called his son or his daughter. This is one of the fatal flaws because there's a shred of truth in it and we know it and it, it stings. It's that we don't deserve his love. And that's that's the platform that gets all the traction. We know we don't deserve it. This is why this story, it's not just a good story that Jesus told. This is why we need to have this image in our minds. It's the Father's embrace. This is the image of God's love that you can't doubt too much, you can't sin too much, you can't squander enough of what God's given you. You can't be unfaithful enough. You can't be rebellious enough <laughs> to stop God's love because his love is far bigger than your sin. And his grace, you can't. So I've heard this phrase, you may have heard it, you can't out-sin God's grace. We hear it, we may agree with it, but it's hard to really accept it. And so this, those are the fatal flaws. God's love is only for the well-behaved. God's love is smaller than my sin. All right, so let's finish up here so we can get to our small groups and talk about this. God's unstoppable love. So what are we leaving here with? <clears throat> is not limited to the well-behaved. Notice that I, the title is actually important here. Because the father very clearly loved his well-behaved son as well. Invited him in. And in the story that Jesus is telling to the people, the people he's talking to 
It's an invitation to them because they're playing the role of the older son. So, here's our takeaways. Your doubts, bad behavior, and intentional wandering, not just the unintentional, but the intentional wandering does not nullify God's love for you. You know, we've said this a couple times. I I don't want to qualify it, but it doesn't mean there won't be consequences for how, for how we act and think and whatever. But it does not nullify God's love for you. On the flip side, think of the older son. <clears throat> Your rigidness or jealousy does not nullify God's love for you. Even when you feel it's completely unfair. The father's love for both his sons is very clear. Next, your feelings of being unworthy do not nullify God's love for you. Again, it's the picture of the father. What did the son say? I am not worthy to be called your son. How did the father respond? Didn't even respond to the question. It wasn't worth answering. Instead, the father turns to his turns to his servants instead of just telling him this his father turns to his servants and shows his son how much he loves him by ex- by acting extravagantly almost inappropriately to this son was his son worthy no but the father's not even willing to answer that question because why cuz it was his son The terrible thing that he had done or things did not nullify the fact that this was still his son. And so this particular parable is showing us a facet of God's love that is for his own people specifically. So we've talked about God loving the scoundrels, which was the Ninevites. They weren't his people at all, (laughs) right? We talked about the judgmental. Uh, both, right? There's his people and other people. Um, this, is, this is the first one where it's, it, it is fully in. This is how he's looking at his own family. And so, no one can wander too far or squander too much. That's the point of the parable. The story is meant to show that you can't out-squander and outwander this youngest son. That's what Jesus is trying to get across. For God not to love them. All right. Um, one more thing before we go to, to small group here. We need to, we need to look, I said we'd come back to it. We need to look at verse 20. Because Jesus showed God's heart for the wanderer and the squanderer in the actions of the father in the parable. So here we go. In verse 20 it says, but while he was still a long way off. What does this suggest about the father? He was watching. (laughs) It's like, what? We don't know how long this guy was gone, but probably a long time. His father was still watching for his son. Right? Jesus didn't have to say that. He could have said when he approached the farm or, or the ranch or whatever. Or his son knocked on the front door. No, 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 no. Remember, this is revealing something about God. He's been waiting for his son to come back. And he didn't, in the story, like God knows, but in the story, the father did not know even if the son was going to come back. He didn't know if he was alive or dead. But he was waiting for him and saw him, recognized him, even in his tattered clothing and probably super skinny frame. (laughs) No food. He saw him. God sees you. He sees you. 
Just think of the tattered, beat up, hungry, broken son, humbled, walking back to the farm. If we could just understand how God sees us, I think it would just change us completely. What does the Father see? He doesn't care about the tattered rags. He doesn't care about the third of the wealth, uh, whatever it was that he squandered. He doesn't care about the terrible things that had been said compared to how much he cares for his son. That's his son. That's what the father sees. That's, what, that's how God sees you. And so when you feel unworthy and maybe are disagreeing, even at this moment, that God truly loves you, think of the younger son. His father was filled with compassion. It's the opposite of what a human should be filled with, seeing a person that's done this to you. The last thing I would feel is compassion for someone who had done this. It's terrible. Brought shame not just on the father, the whole family would have been shamed and despised at that point. But he's filled. Not just a little compassion. Didn't have sympathy. Compassion. Deep feeling for his son. And then he did the unthinkable because remember, uh, well, if you know what people wore in the first century, uh, the men like, wore robes and stuff, so he would have had to hike up his skirts, <laughs> his robe, and run, which was very undignified at the time. You don't do that, first century. A dignified man would never do that. And this, again, is what makes the story so interesting, that Jesus is undignifying the Father because he loves so much. So he ran. He hugged, right? Get in here. He's probably in the middle of his big speech, all snotty and crying, and his father's like, ah! <laughs> right? Kiss him. Welcome home. You can't stop being my son or daughter. That's the image that, that we have of the father. Because the Father is representative of God. God allows us to wander. And scandal, another scandal is that he, he'll give us. <laughs> like, look what he gave the Son. But he is waiting for us always to come back. And he doesn't hold any of it against us. And that, again, is mind-blowing because that's not our experience with other people, right? So God's unstoppable love, if it's truly unstoppable, has to include the wanderer and the squanderer. If God did not love the wanderer and the squanderer, we would all be in trouble. <laughs> we all squander what God entrusts to us, and we all wonder. You guys, an old hymn, you guys may not know it, but prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. Something in us, we drift away, we wander. And so this is super good news. This is, one of, this is like one of the best stories ever. That God doesn't hold the wandering against us. But he's waiting for you to come into his embrace. So the good news is that God loves you regardless of of your faults, flaws, doubts, and rebellious behavior. <laughs> Seriously. His love is that unstoppable. And on the flip side, God also loved the ones who haven't wandered. doesn't have a greater love for the younger son. Like, it's not trying to compare the loves between the sons. 
He loves the ones who are faithful. But he doesn't love them because they haven't wandered. (laughs) And that's where that fatal flaw comes in. That's not where his love is, and that's revealed again in the story, where he's, he's like, come, join the party. Like, you've been with me this whole time. Like, take a break. <laughs> Have some fun. Eat some steak. Maybe a ribeye, I don't know. So God, God loves the ones who haven't wandered, not because they haven't wandered. Just like the father in the story, God loves both of the sons, and he loves, and we're the sons, daughters, or we're the sons, at times we're the younger son, older son, we can see ourselves, as well as the audience that Jesus is speaking to, (laughs) because we're the audience as well now. God loves both because they are his sons and daughters. So if you've decided to follow Jesus, this is one of those magnificent stories And if you haven't, this is one of those stories that goes like, yeah, I want that. (laughs) And you can become one of God's sons and daughters. This is the love that he has. In fact, in uh, our next edition of God's Unstoppable Love, we're going to talk about, um, I haven't got a title for it yet, but God loves the church. I don't know. Maybe I can come up with a better title, but that's where we're going. The essence of God's love is based on your identity. As a child of God, that's where it comes from. And that is more important than you can imagine. I'm not worthy to be loved. And yet... God runs to us, throws his arms around us, kisses us. You're my son, you're my daughter. That's what makes you worthy.